you know, hello, welcome from the anarchist jurisdiction, Portland, Oregon. Um, I think there was a poll in there that can pop up. Poll. Riot. <laughs> uh, yeah. So whole, uh, Portland's been an interesting place for the past few weeks. I've got my mask with me um, and I've had it with me a lot lately. But the question is, what's it for today? Right. Is it for COVID-19? Is it for tear gas from the uh, police going and starting riots? Is it from wildfire smoke or is it just because I'm going to be doing some soldering? So uh, it says I can't vote. That's not fair. <laughs> Listen, so once we get the results, can vote. Only attendees can vote. Only yeah. attendee can vote. Okay. Well, we want to get the results. Oh, you know, you actually got it today. So the the this this mask does not do a good job with COVID nineteen. It's got a vent, so it lets all the air that you breathe out just go straight out right onto other people. So uh, it doesn't really help the preventing spread. Um, it does work decently well for tear gas, but you probably want an actual gas mask um, just to be safe. Um, however, it did work great for the wildfire smoke. Uh, luckily that has subsided. Um, and, you know, I, we actually have clean, breathable air for the time being. But we'll see about that. Today we will do just a moment of soldering though. Um, because I don't want to turn on the solder, the, the fan, because it's gonna make too much noise, I'll, I'll throw this on just to make it a little quieter for you. But what's the point? Why are we here? Today is uh, spy versus spy, right? The nitty gritty details about reading and writing little bits of firmware. So this is supposed to be a workshop. Um, the reality though is uh, the workshops I do have a lot of hardware involved because I'm a hardware person. So rather than send out hardware to everybody to go and tag along, um, I've got this set up ready to go. So you can go and see basically all the stuff going on that I'm working on. And I will gonna work through a bunch of different scenarios where we might want to spy on not other spies, right? I know this is supposed to be a threat intel conference, but whatever. But we're gonna spy on spy chips, SPI, right? So you may have heard about these in the past couple of days. These are the chips that hold all sorts of little tiny bits of firmware. And when I say tiny, I don't take that lightly. Tiny means a few megabytes, which is actually plenty of space to hold a quite a bit of stuff, both uh, functional as well as malicious. We'll look at a bunch of different ways that we can go and uh, find these spy chips, locate them, identify them, connect to them, and then read the contents of them as well as write them back and make sense of what's inside. So nothing new, nothing groundbreaking. I'm just going to walk you through a whole bunch of tools that I've used in the past and continue to use on a regular basis. So you're familiar with what's actually involved in these. So through the whole thing, um, I would, I have the question box open up right here. Um, I'd love to have you keep uh, opening, like asking questions throughout the whole thing. So I'm going to do a lot of hands-on stuff. I'll keep checking the questions. So ask, ask, ask. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my uh, background is electrical engineering. Um, I've been playing with hardware for years at this point. I started out doing speed path and silicon debug of CPUs, moved into product security, decided that I really didn't like actually doing the work. I'd rather tell other people what to do. So for the past eight years, I've been doing training. Um, I have training on physical attacks on x86 systems, embedded systems, and hardware pen testing. Um, and as of now, I've actually got um, some online classes that I've started teaching in the past few months. Um, so yeah, we've got the diode schematic symbol. Um, how much does a spy chip cost? How many pins and how difficult to solder? We'll see all of that very soon. Um, so this is a spy flash chip. This is looking inside a Windows tablet. Um, tiny little computer, that big, actually I got it right here, All right? This computer, look at the back, look closely in this little corner and we've got um, a flash chip. So this one is made by a company called Winbond, right? It's got a part number and these part numbers are pretty universal. So I can just look at the part number and say, oh, I see a one six, that tells me it's one six, 16 megabit, which means this is an, a two megabyte, uh, spy flash, right? Now it's eight pins. I have that little indicator right there is how I start counting the pins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up, oh, seven, eight. Now the great thing about spy flash chips is there's so many manufacturers of them that they basically um, don't, uh, don't uh, bother changing it. Like they want to be a compatible chip that anybody can use and stick in somewhere else. Um, can I explain how a Zener diode 
differs from a regular one in three words. Put in backwards. Um, Zener diode, you put in the opposite direction because then it uh, help, helps to maintain a voltage from going below a certain point, uh, per, uh, a point, whereas a regular diode you put in with the current intending to go through. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that one's related to spy flash. I think that was just kind of a, a quiz um, trying to test if I knew what I was talking about. Half the time I don't, so it's probably worthwhile. Anyway, we've got the spy flash chip. I'm using these little probe clips. I'll look at them up close. Uh, these little probe clips in this example to clip on there and listen and talk to those pins, right? Now, let's talk a little bit more about spy flash chips, right? Um, so anybody recognize this picture from the recent past? Um, this is a super micro server. Um, anybody ever like heard, oh, that was, that was two years ago, right? Uh, so this is a super micro server. We've got a board management controller. The BMC is kind of this like backside management CPU with uh, all sorts of capabilities, ARM processor. Um, and meanwhile, we've got actually two flash chips, two spy flash chips in here. This eight pin fl spy flash chip is the BIOS for the server. This 30, uh, sorry, 16 pin, 16? Yeah, 16 pin spy flash chip is the firmware for the, um, what's it called? Uh, the, the, the actual BMC itself. We've even got an extra spot right here to put an extra spy flash chip. That's actually because sometimes it might be that the eight pin chips are cheaper than the 16 pin chips, whatever they put whichever one in. However, someone decided it'd be a nice fan fiction story to throw a tiny little chip right there. You can barely make it out because it's so small. Um, it's been enlarged so much. There's a tiny grain of rice in there. Okay. So um, this is an alleged, um, let's, correct the spelling, spy chip, whereas these are in fact SPI chips. What is spy? Serial peripheral interface or interconnect, right? So we got, we got spy chips, we got spy chips, you know, we got everything going all together. So, um, reality, this is not, this is not actually a spy chip. This is just a bunch of, uh, fan fiction about, you know, fear mongering and, uh, yeah, fun, silly stories. We're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the actual spy chips. So someone asked how much do they, these cost, right? So when we look at these chips, we have two different kinds of flash, um, very common in systems. We have serial flash and parallel flash. Serial flash is often NOR flash, uh, this parallel flash is often NAND, right? A different kind, N-A-N-D. So the advantage of NAND is it's much more dense. We can put more in, right? NOR is not as dense, but it's actually really handy and easy to read. So we might get a spy flash chip like this, which is gonna be about eight megabytes, right? Whereas a NAND chip like this might be eight gigabytes, right? A spy chip like this, a serial chip, is going to have one wire in and one wire out. So when we get our data in and out, we're doing it very slowly, one bit at a time. It's typically uh, like about 25 megahertz. Whereas a NAND chip, we have a parallel 8 to 16, uh, oops, 16 bit wide bus that we can get tons of data in and out at the same time. If we were building an SSD, if we were building like a large storage device, we'd use NAND. We'd use a whole bunch of NAND chips in parallel so we can get them to come and read out and store stuff really fast. If we just want to hold a few bytes of information, spy flash is the way to go. It's dirt cheap, right? We're talking about a dollar or less, right? It's pretty cool. Um, it's easy to read. It's easy to write. There's dozens of manufacturers. They all support pretty much the same pinout. They're the same size. Um, so, Let's look at what that means. Here's the pinout for an eight pin spy flash chip. Whether you get this from Winbond or Macronix or uh, Atmel or anyone else, it's gonna have the same order of pins and pretty much the same purpose, right? We have power and ground. That's what actually makes the thing go on and work, right? We have some control signals, a clock and a select signal. And then what's most important are these input and output signals. That's where the data comes in. So we have ones and zeros that fill up the flash and we have ones and zeros that come out of the flash at a electrical level. We also have a couple extra pins. Those are bonuses, no one ever uses them. So don't worry about those. 
So let's get on to some demos. Like what the heck are these spy flash chips um, and where are they? So let's get some hands on. So first we'll take a look at the desktop. Um, get my safety goggles out of the way. And first let's see what we got here in uh, box number one. Let's see uh, what's wrapped up in the hoodie. We've got a Wi-Fi router. So target number one for today is our Wi-Fi router. We take a look at it and this thing is pretty simple. It's got a processor that's doing all the real work. Um, it's got a couple spots for antennas straight to the processor. This is what's gonna do all the data in and out, got network ports. Um, we have a piece of memory right here, that's, that's our RAM. But over here is the important thing for today. We've got our spy flash chip. Now, this spy flash chip is the only storage on this whole system. So this spy flash chip actually needs to hold an entire Linux installation. How big do you think it is? It's eight megabytes. In eight megabytes, we managed to fit a whole file system, a bootloader, a kernel compressed, um, and some read writable space for the end user. How are we gonna get to it? We could use these tiny little uh, clips. Um, they're a bit uh, small and hard to get. Um, I'm a little bit lazy today, so I'm just gonna go and use the all-in-one clip. I'm gonna clip all eight pins at the same time. And it takes a little practice to get on here. Let me go back to the close-up. Takes a little practice to get this on there and you can hardly see as a, oh, there we go. But yeah, we just gotta clip it on in place right onto that chip. Let me turn it both. There we go, much better view, right? So we clip it, make sure we get some nice connections. And at this point, it's connected. So now we actually need to talk to the spy flash chip. What I'm gonna to use today is this little board Tigerd. Uh, shameless plug, there is a crowd supply campaign for Tigerd. It should be started any day now. Um, I have a whole bunch of these on order. This is a little board that, that speaks a lot of different protocols. It does UART, it does JTAG, it does uh, SWD, it does SPY, it does I squared C. Um, this is what I use in my classes. Um, but what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna pop the other end of that cable onto here, right? Bam, right? And now we can go and look back at the desk. Now we've got to find a USB cable somewhere. There's got to be a USB cable. Oh, this is, this is USB-C, wave of the future. So USB-C, we're going to plug this in, right? We'll set this device up. And actually what we have to do is we have to power this router, right? The spy flash chip needs to be powered to be read. The problem is we don't want this CPU talking. So we have a little jumper here, I soldered on, that's gonna keep the CPU in reset. So the CPU is resetting, it's not powering on. If I were to take that off, we'd see some lights flash because it's gonna boot up, but we don't want it to boot up. We wanna hold down that reset button, right? And we're gonna sit here and we are going to make sure we have a really good electrical connection. There we go. Now we're gonna flip over to the computer. So, now we've done all this hard work. We spent hours and hours sleuthing, discovering where this elusive spy chip was. We found it on our board. We, we did some research. We had to go on like uh, uh, Yandex and uh, Baidu to find data sheets for this elusive product, uh, which is a standard pinout. So really it hasn't been all that hard so far. So perhaps the hard part is here with the software. Um, so we need to go and read this. So uh, now we're gonna run a program called Flash ROM. Right, flash ROM is a pretty universal tool that is designed for flashing ROM chips, specifically spy flash chips. Um, now you might say, oh, that's a really long uh, string of text that I have to type. And yeah, it is annoying. But if you ever get lost, you just look at the back of your tiger board and you'll see that line of text is right there for you to remember. Flash ROM dash P FT 2232 underscore spy colon type 2232H dot port, or sorry, comment port equals B comma divisor equals four. So, you know, it looks complicated. You don't need to worry about what it actually means. All it means is that we're gonna read that flash chip. Hit enter. Oh, it did not work. So sometimes it doesn't work the first time. Sometimes you have to be a little careful with the way you connect, connect your pins. I often use these, uh, uh, inexpensive clips and sometimes, uh, let's see if we can get a close-up view. Sometimes you see that those, those little metal pins don't line up so we have to adjust them, make sure they're really just in the right spot. It is annoying, you know, but hey, it happens. Oh, it's still lined, lined up. Let me just uh, adjust this where I can see it. There we go. 
And then I'll clip the clip back on the chip. And then I'll go back to the computer and I will read it. Yay, we found our chip, we're reading our flash. And we're done, that's it. We did it, we read a spy flash chip. It took us all of six seconds once we were able to get all those wires hooked up. So let's take a step back. Um, now we've read the contents of this chip. What's next? Can we write the contents of this chip? So what's really interesting about SPY and other kinds of flash is flash isn't a block device. So we look, think about of a disk drive. We can read bytes off the disk and we can write bytes to the disk. Um, with SPY, we can do the same thing. We can read bytes off the SPY flash chip. We can write bytes to the flash chip, but we must erase the chip before we can write to it, okay? And funny enough, it's a NOR flash chip. That means if we write to something that's already been written, it actually NORs our writes together and makes a mess. So, um, so what we have to do is we have to erase it. And sometimes erasing is actually a difficult process. We have to go and sometimes create a higher voltage. Sometimes we have to do some analog magic. Um, sometimes it takes a long time. If we look at the data sheet for this device, it might tell us that uh, writing a spa, the, erasing the spy flash chip may take up to 90 seconds. So that's annoying. Um, so let's take a look. Um, if we want to write this, we do the exact same thing, except we do dash W and we can go and write a bit of firmware back to it. Let's see how long that takes. So flash ROM is very cautious. It's going to read the contents first. Um, and it tells me it's identical. Oops. So let me, uh, read right back a different file. Let's see. Downloads. Yeah. So it reads the contents first. And now it's writing to it. So I erased it and it's written and it's already verifying. And that was quick. So it, it took us 12 seconds to write. Um, so I said it takes up to 90 seconds. It's not like, uh, you know, predictable. It's not like, oh, there's a lot to write. There's a little to write. Erasing just takes time. Take, erasing the whole chip takes a while, right? And so sometimes it takes 90 seconds. Sometimes it takes 10 seconds. Sometimes uh, you never know. What the hardware and the software is doing when it happens is basically it, uh, um, it's going and telling the chip to erase itself. And it kept checking the chip. Hey, chip, are you erased? Hey, chip, are you erased? Hey, chip, are you erased? And finally, the chip will say, yes, 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 I'm erased. And it'll spit it back. So that was, yeah, quick. Um, so let's go back to what we're talking about next. So when we talk about what's inside of a flash, spy flash chip, right? On this embedded system, we've got an entire Linux installation. And this is broken up into different sections. Just like you might take a disk drive and partition it, you can take a spy flash chip and partition it as well. So what we've got in our whole eight megabytes is at first we have a bootloader. This is what runs when the system first turns on, right? Then we have some specific stuff. We don't need to worry about that. But then here we go. This is what we think of as our operating system. So this is like our boot sector, right? This is like our file system. And inside that we've got a kernel, right? Oftentimes this is compressed. Right. Once we've got that kernel decompressed, we can start booting it. It's going to go ahead and mount a bunch of file systems that it finds in the flash image. Right. Now, we just hooked up a wire and dumped the contents of a flash image. Um, what can we make sense? What sense can we make of that? Let's take a look. So um, let's uh, let's. Oh, actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a second before I go and do the spy flash on the PC. I'm going to go back uh, and take apart this spy flash file. So we're going to use a tool called binwalk, right? And actually, is, it, is the screen big enough? Let me uh, control shift plus, let's make it a little bigger. Um, actually, let's do this. Oh, yeah. Let me make it smaller so you can see it. But yeah, whatever. The dilemma of being on screen all the time. So we'll use binwalk, and we'll run binwalk on our test.bin. And Binwalk is going to walk through and it's going to look for all the things that look like files. And it's going to make a mess because control, because I made the text too big. So basically, we look at this, we say, OK, Binwalk found a bunch of things. It found a string that says it's using uBoot. uBoot's a bootloader. It found some HTML files, a kinds of copyright stream. It find, finds a header for a kernel, right, for a MIPS processor. And it's actually a Linux 318.36 kernel. It has some compressed data. This happens to be the kernel itself. 
it has a file system that's based on SquashFS and a file system that's based on JFS2. So one single command is going to walk through this whole file and find all these pieces. Now, what's really interesting is if we go back to what our screen says, hey, what did we have? We had a bootloader. What came next? A compressed kernel. What was after that? A SquashFS file system and then a JFFS file system. So we can see from the docs, we go and dump the firmware. We go and run a tool that's going to find all these pieces for us. We can go then and extract this file system, modify files, repack it, and flash it back. Right? The, the thing with SpyFlash is SpyFlash is designed to be the cheapest way to store data for uh, whatever your purpose is. It's not encrypted. It doesn't support any sort of encryption. It's not secure. It doesn't support any sort of security. Now, you could say, oh, well, I'm going to encrypt my file system. And that sounds like a great idea. And some people try and do that. But my question for you is, where's the key, right? You need to store the key somewhere. And the only storage this system has is a spy flash chip. So we'll just put the key right here, right? And use that key to decrypt the file system. That sounds like a waste of time. Whatever, it's obfuscation. In the hardware realm, obfuscation is still a difficult thing to deal with. It's not as trivial as it becomes in the software realm of things. But very soon, it's, 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 uh, um, it's no longer really a good idea to think that you can just you know, store a key in a spy flash and store your encrypted data in a spy flash and be safe. So let's look at another system that does that. So we talk about spy flash, and I talked about an embedded system that uses it for the entire installation. Now let's talk about a different system. In bag number two, okay. we've got a laptop, right? A laptop that's already conveniently open. Um, let me make some space on my desk. And you know, let's get this stuff out of the way, unplug that silly router. Um, so we got a laptop, let's take a look inside. Um, now laptops these days, uh, hugest thing is of course the screen, right? Next, the next largest thing we've got is the battery. Wow, this thing is worse at focusing than me. There we go. Um, we've got the battery up here, and then we've got this little circuit board up here, which basically is everything, okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to um, find the spy flash chip. And this one, it actually hides the spy flash chip underneath this heat, heat spreader. So we're going to open this up because eh, why not? Now, a lot of systems are going to make it so the spy flash chip on a PC is very easy to find. The reason why is because if they ever need to go and do some repair or debug, they want quick access to it. Um, some systems will be care will be you know nice and they'll have like a, a debug header that it just pop a clip on there and connects and gets spy flash. Some will be uh, what's it called a little less careful. They'll just keep the spy flash chip. So now we're looking at this board and maybe we can zoom in a little bit. Um, we need to find an eight pin spy flash chip. Anybody see an eight pin spy flash chip? Anybody see it? So same size as everything else. So we've got the CPU, we've got some memory, right? Uh, we've got, uh, oh, what's that? Eight pins, little dot in the corner. Let's take a look under the microscope. There we go. And this one is an MXIC25U64. 6.4 tells me 64 megabit. Divide that by eight, we've got an eight megabyte full spy flash chip. So where'd my clip go? Clip, 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 clip. Take my clip. Come on over here and clip it on. I'm going to use that little dot to help me find pin one. And you like. Don't do this at home unless you have broken hardware that you don't care about. Um, so here's the dilemma. Now we've got a spy flash, flash chip on there. We've got our, our, our reader writer board. Um, now I can use this board to spot supply power to a spy flash chip, but if I'm trying to do that, I'm going to try and power the whole laptop off this tiny little board. 
So we get into this weird situation where it's like, oh, well, how do we turn it on? Some systems have been very well designed um, where we can just uh, take care of them this way. Let's see if I can get the... So what I'm doing is I'm opening up the... Uh, where are we? Side camera. I'm opening up the laptop. I've got this stuff set up up here. I'm gonna try and push the power button at the same time. And what I wanna see is I wanna see this thing detect power. It's kind of hard to see uh, because the light's a little washed out, but it should turn on when power is available. <laughs> so I think the battery's dead. Let me grab a power cable. Again, sorry about the focus. Really, it's like It's like me trying to get work done. And as soon as we plug this in, there we go. As soon as we plugged it in, we saw that little light pop up. So let's go over to our control computer and we're gonna read an image again, but we're gonna read the laptop image. Do, 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 do. Didn't work. I thought this might happen. It looks like the system turned back off. Uh, let me try again. It happens like this sometimes. Um, I had a scenario once where I was trying to get a system to work and it wouldn't work. I couldn't figure out why. And I start searching on the internet for people's tips on how to make it work. And I find someone on Reddit who had this great thread, this great wonderful thread about all the different ways of reading Spy Flash and what to do when it doesn't work. And I read through this whole thread and at the end they're like, oh, there's this one great post, this blog post you should read. And it has a lot of details that are really helpful. And I said, oh, this is what I'm looking for. And I read it and I followed the link and the link was actually to a blog post I had made. So I was trying to get flat, spy flash reading. I was reading actually a blog post that was referring to something I had written um, and I couldn't get it to work, but they could. And I thought it wasn't fair. Let me just double check that my clips nice. Now, if you want to get fancy, you can use the expensive clips that are like $12 each. But these $1 clips are a lot cheaper and I have a lot of them. So that's what I'm using. Let's try one more time. I just reclipped it. No, nope. hey, so today it's not working. Oh, well, it worked yesterday. It's the thought that counts, right? So I do actually have another system lying around. So, uh, and now the computer's making weird beeping sounds, whatever. It was already a broken computer. I'll put it in the pile with the others. So da, 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 da. I'm going and skimming some of the chat. I don't see any questions popping up, um, but let's go back. Um, and we've actually got uh, a couple different tools we can use to read spy flash. So back to the desk. Um, I've been using this board, the tiger board. Come on, focus, it's your job. There we go. Um, I've been using this board, this tiger board um, because uh, it's what I use for my classes. This is the SF600. This is made by a company called Dediprog, right? Um, it costs a few hundred bucks. It reads five spy flash chips. Um, this is what's used by a lot of OEMs and stuff who make PCs to go and read the board. There is a connector on the end. There's actually a thing you can pop on top. Um, the other one that I use a lot, this is a Mini Pro TL866. Costs about $50 from China. Um, and it just works. I mean, it's got a USB-A connector. It could be worse, it could be USB mini, but whatever. You got, as long as you got the cable, you plug in any number of hundreds of adapters they have, and you can just pop your spy flash chip in there and read it. Um, there's software that they provide from a sketchy website that runs in Windows. There's also an open source uh, reverse engineered tool set that works on it as well. Um, that works pretty well, so that's what I use. Um, so those are two examples. There are a lot of third-party programmers. And just so you get an idea, there are tons of these things. There's tons of different devices. This is my box of FTDI boards. I've got a bus blaster. I've got a Tau. I've got this inexpensive CJMCU Chinese uh, FTDI board. Um, these are another inexpensive one. I don't like these because they have sharp corners, uh, whatever priorities. But you, know, you can get these boards from anywhere from $7 to $15 for one that's made in New York City by Adafruit um, and uh, several others from different sources. Again, all these boards are based on the same or similar chips. They all do the same job. They work with the same software of reading and writing firmware images. Um, so I actually have another 
target. which is a Windows tablet. Um, now, first we need to get this thing open. So I've got my, you know, my hardware opening tool. Uh, and basically, oh, let me show the deck. Oh, let me do it over here. So it's a guitar pick, if you aren't familiar. Um, not only does this machine kill fascists, it also opens hardware really conveniently. And we have the inside of a tablet. Now, I've actually dealt with this tablet before and know for a fact that the way this tablet is wired, it really doesn't want me to be powering the chip without powering the CPU. Um, so when you design this system, you can actually keep that in mind. Um, let me take a peek at like the way we wire this up. Basically, when we wire spa, spy flash, this is the CPU and this is the, the flash, right? And the CPU needs to be in control of three of these wires. So if I come in with my clip and I start talking on these wires, right? CPU gets pissed off, right? And so I just got to keep talking louder until the CPU just kind of shuts up. It's kind of like, this is Mike Pence and this is Kamala Harris and the moderator, and he's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Mr. Mr. Pence, your time is up. Mr. Pence, your time is up. Well, CPU, your time is up. Please move on. Um, so whatever. We need to be able to talk to this. Some boards do a good job, and they put little isolation bits in there. Um, and those isolation bits, let it be read and write, written easily. And that laptop has those, those, those uh, diodes in there, so I'm not sure why it wasn't working for us today. This one does not. So for this one, I've got the other approach. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use, uh, normally I would go too many, normally I'd go over here to the soldering station. I've got a microscope set up and I've also got a, a Velcro that's sticking to my feet. Um, so normally I'd pop this on, which turns power on to the, the solder station, the, uh, the microscope and whatever. But for whatever reason this morning, the microscope did not want to show up on the screen, um, over zoom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pull it over here. Um, I've got a solder station that I won't call, I mean, it's fancy, but it's not that fancy. It's not something that you shouldn't be able to get your hands on. Um, and we've got these hot tweezers, right? And now I haven't adjusted these hot tweezers. I was using them for surface mount uh, work recently. So I'm gonna adjust them by just twisting the bits a tiny bit. They're hot, so I'm using the, that thing, this little rubber pad. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and... Oh, you can't even see my desk. Desk, desk, desk. There we go. I'm going to basically come onto this board and... Come on. Left and right get really mixed up when you're, when you're presenting stuff. Here's my spy flash chip. I'm just going to walk up there to the spy flash chip and say hello. Oh, there we go. That's it. That's the job that we need to do. We need to take the spy flash chip off. So again, really difficult, really tough, you know, really fine soldering skills required. Um, but the end result is you have that chip and it's right off the board. And I'm gonna clip this clip right onto it. I just need to figure out where pin one is. It's in that corner right there. So there we go. Now, in this case, I've got the spy flash chip in the clip. I've got the clip to the board. I'm going to go and turn power on. I'm going to apply 3.3 volts to this chip so that I can read it. And I'll go back to my PC. And I should be able to do it again this time. And it doesn't work. Hey, it doesn't work for everybody every time. So I'm going to unplug and plug it in. Nope. So the point of this presentation is to show you how easy it is to accidentally put it in backwards. Ah, when you put it in backwards, um, you are putting voltage where it shouldn't be. So maybe I've destroyed that. Um, it also gets really hot. So maybe I can uh, try this again. You might think, oh, you just put voltage the wrong way and it got really hot. It probably doesn't work anymore. Eh, it's worth a shot. Let's try this again. Finally, nope, 
Yep, we found a Winbond W25Q16. This is a two megabyte, megabit, megabyte flash chip. Took all of two seconds to read the contents of it. It says this is untested because they just don't have specific information on this specific chip. But we do have a successful dump. If we can use Binwalk, Binwalk again is, is really targeted towards embedded devices, um, but embedded firmwares, but it, it, it's good at finding stuff. So Binwalk, and what do we call our file? Laptop.bin. And sure enough, it finds stuff, right? UEFI, UEFI PI firmware volume. Okay, we're finding all our firmware. We have a bunch of PEs. Uh, all of uh, those are PEs. We have a copy of our microcode that's going to get loaded onto the CPU. We have, oh, oh, what's this? Certificate in DR format. What do we need certificates for, right? What do we need certificates for on a PC? On a PC that supports secure boot. Well, um, it turns out if we want to boot a PC that uses secure boot, we actually need to go and check signatures on things. And so right there inside of our firmware, we've got a certificate, right? And that certificate is from Microsoft, and that's what checks the signature on whatever kernel or bootloader gets loaded. Hmm. So, I mean, by design, by requirement, you are able to go and change the certificates on your PC. That is a compatibility requirement that Microsoft requests, but requires, I believe, um, that you can go and change those. But again, if you have physical access to the system, you have physical access to that spy chip, there is nothing preventing you from modifying those signatures. Um, as you can see, even in the scenario where you couldn't go and clip and directly read and write, um, it took me all of two seconds to grab that chip off there and take it off and read and write the contents of it. So uh, yeah, PE files. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. I don't use that crap. Um, if it's not a, if it's not a, uh, what's it called? It's not an elf. I don't, I don't touch it. Um, so again, we talked about uh, getting spy flash on a PC with a light, slightly unsuccessful demo. Um, we talked about the contents of that flash chip. I showed you some toys that we could use. Um, and now we're talking about getting spy flash from a tablet. Um, yeah. So we did that. We couldn't read it, read it directly off the tablet. We had to use a pair of hot tweezers to go and pop the chip right off and read the contents of it. Um, and we were able to get that um, quick chip off demo. Uh, we ranted about secure boot for just a moment. We already talked about how um, we have to interrupt the CPU repeatedly in order to be able to go and read the spy flash chip directly. Um, oh, this one didn't come out. Hummer, this is one of the best ones. It was uh, like barefoot vegan kung fu anarchist jurisdiction. But whatever. Can't have them all. Um, I've got uh, about 12 minutes left. Um, and so what I am going to do um, is just mention that the... Actually, I'll, I got time. 12 minutes. I'll do it. Desk. Camera. So what's cool about this board, this Tiger board that I use, um, this is not just a shameless plug. This is like an actual useful features. I've got this, which is a logic analyzer. A logic analyzer goes and reads data and lets me interpret this one's a bit magic. And I can go and get this cable and plug it in right here, right? And now as I read and write a spy flash chip, I can hook this up and I can analyze what's going on. So if things aren't working, if I really wanted to debug what was going on with that laptop, what I would do is I would come over to my PC and I would start a program called PulseView. So PulseView is a logic analyzer tool suite. And what it does is it looks at those pins of that chip and reads them really fast. And it reads them as fast as I tell it to. So I want it to go and read at, uh, let's say, 16 megahertz, I want it to read um, tons and tons of samples. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this all ready. So I'm going to do a read from flash ROM at the same time. So I'll run and then, oops, run. Why isn't run working? It's one of those days. Mm -hmm -hmm. So typically what I would do is I would hit run. Oh, there we go. And then I would do my read and then I would stop. And then I would look at this logic analyzer and see what it saw. And sure enough, this is spy flash being read. So if we look really close, we'll see that uh, this is 
a pretty ugly capture. But uh, we basically can look at all those wires, the ones and zeros on those signals. I'm not going to dive into the detail of how to interpret these, but basically we have communication coming in each direction. Can we implant malicious code in SpyShip? Yes, of course. It's just storage. It holds whatever you want it to hold, whether it's malicious or non-malicious, whether it's encrypted or not. Um, and again, I showed you how easy it is to go and rip it off a system to read the contents of it and to write the contents of it. And pretty much that's all you need to do, read, write, and uh, resolder it. Um, what is difficult is figuring out the right malicious code to put in there. But all you software people are really good at that. I'm not. You guys are. So um, let's close up that. Let's go back over to my tablet and kind of summarize what I have to say. And then you can ask me some questions. Number one, Spy Flash is cheap. It's everywhere, right? So it's inexpensive. And it's just going to be a little bit of storage, just enough to do important stuff. Um, it stores important stuff. And that's the dangerous part about it is everybody's like, oh, well, you just throw a, a dollar at the problem and we've got a place to store our keys. Um, except that it's not actually a safe place to store keys. You actually should be using a key store of some sort, some sort of secure enclave. Spy Flash has zero built-in protection or security. It is by default a plain text thing. It is universal and interchangeable, so you can use any spy flash chip you want. Um, and that is uh, why. Can we implant a spy chip in a grain of rice? So the dilemma with this is the size of the storage. And NAND flash is not particularly small. Um, so you really wouldn't get much storage space into um, uh, a, a grain of rice. You would probably be able to get a lot more computation power into a grain of rice if you had the time, resources, and um, you know, uh, mission creep that <laughs> led to that. So that's my answer to that question. So a little bit more about the tools we use today. Tigered is the one that I use for most of my stuff. There is a crowd supply campaign that will be starting soon. Shameless plug, I am running the crowd supply campaign. Um, Bitmagic is the logic analyzer I used. It's built by a friend of mine, uh, also from Oregon, um, who, uh, who builds and manufactures them uh, himself. Uh, art artisanal logic analyzers, that's what we do here in Oregon. We used three tools, flash ROM, bin walk, and pulse view. And of course, my uh, ever never ending shameless plug, I teach classes on this stuff. Um, right now I've got hands-on self-paced security training that's gonna probably launch on uh, within the next two weeks um, where you basically sign up and I ship you a box of hardware, some of it you've seen today, um, and you walk through a whole bunch of different tasks on how to do hardware hacking. So, um, I'll see if I can answer some questions for the rest of the time. I don't recall. Am I, am I done at 20 or 30 minutes past the hour? Um, yeah, HSMs are hard. Let's use spy instead. Do those DIR files contain private keys? They shouldn't, but sometimes they do. The training sounds awesome. It is. Um, Easter eggs, Easter eggs. Yeah, there was a lot of, uh, of Portland stuff. And those were all by a Portland artist who took an uh, old movie uh, movie posters uh, from sketchy movies and uh, modified them.